Welcome everybody. Welcome. My name is Nikki Lefebvre and I'm the Executive Director of the Natick Historical Society. We were established in 1870 and today we remain an independent nonprofit. We thrive on the support of community members like you. Um, so thank you for helping make events like these possible. Um, our mission is to serve the community by inspiring connections to local history. Uh, and Frederick Douglass was here. So that is local history. Uh, we're, we're quite proud of that. Um, but I'm especially excited to be here tonight for a community read of Frederick Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? I want to thank Mass Humanities for making this year's event possible, along with the National Endowment for Humanities and the More Perfect Union Initiative. Mass Humanities does a lot of uh, incredible work inspiring and supporting these kinds of community reads of Douglas's speech across the Commonwealth. Um, and it's an especially important contribution to dialogue um, at any time of the year, but especially around this time of Juneteenth and the 4th of July. Um, I want to thank Natick Pegasus for uh, recording and making this um, uh, uh, reading accessible beyond uh, tonight's event. And I also want to thank um, our partners this evening, uh, Natick for Black Lives Matter, which was founded by Deborah Mitchell. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to the members of that organization and especially to Deborah for all the work she did in uh, connecting us with readers and uh, making sure the community was aware of this reading. So big thanks to Deborah Mitchell. Um, and yes, yes. I'm thrilled to be joined by our readers here tonight, and I applaud all of you for standing up and taking on reading parts of this speech. So a round of applause for all of our readers. Um, at the end of the reading, at the end of the reading, I will um, share every reader's name, uh, and uh, and then we can appreciate them at the end for their contributions to uh, to tonight's event. Um, I also want to note uh, that if you are moved by this reading and if you have thoughts to share or questions to ask, our, um, our keynote introducer, historian Brenna Greer, will be happy to have some informal dialogue with you after the event. Um, and we will first take a picture of all of our readers, um, but then Brenna will be around if you've got thoughts or questions or just want to engage in a little bit of conversation. Um, so we'll make sure that uh, she's visible just just uh, in front of the a library here um, and with that uh, I would like to introduce uh, Brenna Greer who's now um, leading us into this speech uh, for the third year in a row and it's really exciting to have her um, deeply grateful for uh, for her uh, contributions to this reading every year so Brenna Wynn Greer is an historian of race gender and culture in the 20th century United States who explores historical connections between capitalism, social movements, and visual culture. Her first book, Represented, The Black Image Makers Who Reimagined African American Citizenship, examines the historical circumstances that made the media representation of black citizenship good business in the post-World War II era. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Nation, Daily Mail, Enterprise and Society, and Columbia Journalism Review. As an associate professor in the Department of History at Wellesley College, Greer teaches courses on World War II, the Cold War, the black freedom struggle, consumerism and capitalism, and visual culture. And I'm also delighted to say that Brennan Greer is among the newest members of the board of the Natick Historical Society. So we're very happy to have her um, as part of our community. So please join me tonight in welcoming Professor Brenna Wing Greer. Thank you, everyone. As Nikki said, this is my third year doing this, and it's really nice to be able to be here, see people gather, but it's also, I realized in preparing today's opening remarks that it makes me think every year over the last year. It forces me to do that. So I have a lot of stuff in my head, so I've tried to contain it. <laughs> but first, I really do want to thank Nikki for everything that she did and the, the Natick Historical Society, everything that they've done to make this happen this year. But 
seemingly successfully establish it as an annual event, which I think is great. I also want to thank the students and the other volunteers who are going to follow up and dramatize this reading for you, this really important reading. Um, I think that this, what to, the, what to the Slave is the 4th of July, is you know, incomparable as a piece of rhetoric. For me, it surpasses Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream or Letter from a Birmingham Jail in terms of its um, reasoning, but also graciousness. And then Malcolm X's Ballad of the, Ballad of the Bullet for its um, shade <laughs> and audacity. And then also James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which I love um, for its beauty, its stylishness, but also its anguish. But if you haven't heard or read any of those, then you cannot understand the praise that I just heaped upon Douglas. Um, and I also suggest that you run to the nearest library and gift to yourself of these other profound ruminations on black freedom. Um, but as a way of grounding you tonight, I just want to give some details about um, the circumstances under which Frederick Douglass gave this speech, which, which was in 1852, July 5th, 1852. He gave the speech to, in Rochester, New York, um, at the invitation of the Rochester's Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, which I always find very interesting, <laughs> right? Um, and Douglass, who had escaped slavery in 1838 at that point in time, was the most famous black man on the planet, due in part to his story but also to his international campaign against slavery and his abolitionist writings. Um, and at that moment, slavery was very much still a thing. Congress had just passed the Fugitive Slave Act, which required that um, enslaved blacks who had escaped to free states be returned to their slaveholder. And then within just five years, the Supreme Court was going to pass a decision that um, denied people of African descent their citizenship. Um, so Frederick Douglass, who was a citizen at this point in time, would then not be a citizen after eight, or 1857. So as you're going to hear this, Black Lives Matter, <laughs> as you're going to hear, what to the slave is the 4th of July is an indictment of white America, with Douglass identifying slavery as foundational to rather than a betrayal of um, American democracy. And now, 170 years later, racial inequality and injustice, in my opinion, continue to not only exist with, but undergird this dramatic or democratic society. And thus, for many, the 4th of July remains, to use Douglass's words, a day that reveals to black Americans, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. These circumstances are pr precisely why many African Americans observe Juneteenth, which passed just this last Sunday, the holiday um, that celebrates the emancipation of enslaved blacks, particularly in Texas. Um, they, uh, many African Americans observe Juneteenth as their Independence Day. So it mattered greatly that when Congress um, voted last year to establish Juneteenth as a federal holiday, that the legislation explicitly designated it as Juneteenth National Independence Day. However, it is precisely that designation that led to some um, Republican members of the House to vote against the bill, with one arguing that we already have an Independence Day. Another claiming, quote, naming this day National Independence Day would create confusion and push Americans to pick one of those days as their Independence Day based on their racial identity. And still another one, it's another one insisting it should be named Juneteenth National Emancipation Day. While their quibble with the name may strike some as offensive, inane, and petty, which it is, it deserves much more than an eye roll because it is representative of a contentious debate characterizing current politics regarding how we approach and convey our nation's history. And the red hot core of that debate is the question of how we teach our children that history, particularly as it pertains to race. And as has, and as has become clear, many would have it that considerations of race and more pointedly racism not be a part of the narrative. 
Since January of last year, Republican state legislatures legister, <laughs> have introduced more than 200 bills intended to restrict how or even if we teach our children about race and racism. For example, a Texas bill that passed last summer prohibits presenting slavery and racism as anything other than deviations from or betrayals to American principles. And collectively, this legislative onslaught opposes any attempts to indoctrinate students to the ideas that whiteness is capital and or racism is embedded within US society. And these are our ideas, two ideas that are tenets of critical race theory. And that's why these bills are often referred to as anti-critical race theory bills. And many of them sing single out by name the 1619 Project as material that has no place in the classroom. And as you may know, the 1619 Project, the 1619 Project was published in 2019 by the New York Times. And it draws our national history back to the arrival of first Africans um, to be enslaved in Jamestown in 1619. And as you are also likely aware, the backlash to this new origin story was swift, pronounced, and supremely political. Many opposed it for reasons similar to one of the Republican Juneteenth naysayers who insisted that, quote, it's not healthy to reach into the dead past, revive its most malevolent conflicts, and re reintroduce them into our age. To which many people of color were thinking, um, that past is far from dead. Then President Daniel, Donald Trump classified the 1619 Project as, quote, a radicalized view of American history that vilifies our founders and our founding. And he identified the project as an example of critical race theory, which he labeled as child abuse. As a counter, he established the 1776 Commission, which, is, which issued a report that called for a true and patriotic education, an education that, quote, equips each generation with a knowledge of America's founding principles, a deep reverence for their liberties, and a profound love of their country. Now, as a teacher, I would insist that my students define true and patriotic. But my bigger concern is who and what is this true and patriotic education for? The 1776 Commission ins insists that we teach our children that, quote, equality and liberty belong by nature to every human being without exception. But this national narrative doesn't reflect our present, let alone our history. As I always tell my students, as storytelling, history is, at its core, all about interpretation and agenda. And to that point, the 1776 report concludes with a quote from Frederick Douglass, which says in part, quote, the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of our nation's destiny. Actually, he says, your nation's destiny. With this move, the report ends on a note that promotes the liberty and justice for all narrative through the words of a black man who was once enslaved, no less. It may surprise you to know that this Douglas quote comes from the speech that you are about to hear, the same speech in which Douglas told his white audience, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. It will probably not surprise you that that passage appears nowhere in the 1776 report, which for me begs the question of agenda. So as you listen to tonight's reading of Douglas's speech, I'd ask that you think about what it reveals about our shared history, and more importantly, to consider how and why and for whom do we teach and learn this history? Thank you. The meaning of the 4th of July for the Negro. Frederick Douglass, July 5th, 1852. Mr. President, friends, and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped 
is considerable, and the difficulties to overcome in getting from the latter to the former are, no, are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birth of your national independence and your political freedom. This to you is, the pas this to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young you are, even now, only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad that this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. Fellow citizens, the simple story is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. The style and title of your sovereign people in which you now glory was not then born. You were under the British crown. Your fathers esteemed the English government as a home government, England as the fatherland, although a considerable distance from your home, imposed in the exercise of its parental prerogatives upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as, in its mature judgment, it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers, who had not adopted the idea of the infallibility of government, in the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and the justice of some of those burdens and constraint, restraints. They went so far as to pronounce the measure of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated they did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers became resisted, resistive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there's always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. In this startling idea, much more so than we, at the distance of time, regarded it. The timid and the prudent of the day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Their opposition, to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful, but amid their terror and affrighted vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshippers of prosperous, pros, property, clothed the, that dreadful idea with the authority of national sanction. But they did so in the form of resolution. We seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day whose transparency is at all equal, equal it. Resolve that the United Colonies are, and of right, 
ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you, therefore, may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history. The very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes. And for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite you to honor their memory. They love their country better than they love their own private interests. And we'll, all will concede that it is a rare vir virtue that ought to command respect. He who will intelligently lay down his life for his country is a man whom it is not in human nature to despise. Your fathers stake their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the cause of their country. They were peacemen, but they were preferred revolution to peaceful submission of bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of an hour, their statementship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future. Fully appreciating the hardships encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, wisely measuring the terrific odds against them, your fathers, the fathers of this republic, laid the cornerstone of the national superstructure, which has risen and still rise grander around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. My business is, I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God in his cause is the ever living now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. Now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and done their work, and have done much of it well. You live and you must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share of labor of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your labors. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your indolence. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits, express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that the affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. But such is not the state of the case. I say it with sad sense of disparity between us. 
I am not included in the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean, citizens, to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions, whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. My subject then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view. Standing here identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slaves on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity which is outraged, in the name of liberty which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet, no one world shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. I fancy I hear some of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of a slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia which, if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but the but the acknowledgement that a slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being. Southern statute books are covered with the enactments forbidding, under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of a slave to read or write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to with the beasts of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of a slave. When the dogs in your streets, the fowls in your air, and the cattle in your hills, when the fish in the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish a slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the, the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are ploughed, ploughing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals and of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle in, uh, on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God, 
and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? We have already declared it. Must I argue uh, the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset uh, with great difficulty involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom? To do so would, <coughs> would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What? Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat, beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with a lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system that's marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that the slavery is not divine? That God did not establish it? That our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There's blasphemy in the thought. That which is inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? I cannot. The time for such argument is past. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear, I would, today, pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened the conscience of the nation must be roused. The property of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the world, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me, that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. Take the American slave trade, which is especially prosperous right now, and carried on in all the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called the internal slave trade, in order to divert from it the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. That trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy, as an execrable traffic, 
to arrest it, this nation keeps a squadron at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic, opposed alike to the laws of God and of man. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade, the American slave trade sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what it, do you know what is a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of these human flesh jobbers armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves warily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear the savage yells, hear his, sa hear his savage yells and his blood chilling oaths as he hurries on the affrighted captives. There, see the old man with locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon the young mo that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of 13, weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. The drove mo moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly, you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her change. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See, the, see men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of, of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever, and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from, the, from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet, this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the United States. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is, today, an active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the South. I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has come, become Virginia and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the star-spangled banner and American Christianity. Where these go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these men are, Man is not sacred. He is a bird for a sportsman's gun.
by that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state and force, as a duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have, within the past two years, been hunted down and, without a moment's warning, hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread, but of this no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men, there are neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic, Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless and in diabolical intent, this fuge slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three million of your countrymen. You, you hurl your anathemas at the crowded headed tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourselves on your democratic institutions while you yourself consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad Honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land, you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bear your bosom to the storm of British artillery to throw off a three-penny tax on tea and yet wring the last hard-earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that of one blood God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and hath commanded all men everywhere to love another. Yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skins are not colored like your own.
You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in a bondage, which, which according to your own Thomas Jefferson is worse than ages of that which your fathers rose in rebellion to oppose, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It, it saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. Be warned. A horrible reptile is, co is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy, crush and destroy it forever. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented, of which the state of the nation I do not despair this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work, for the down, work the downfall of slavery. I, therefore, leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot around in the same old path of its fathers without interference. This, the time when such, the time when such could be, the time when such could be done, but a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkness of corners of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on another. In fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let everyone heart join in in saying it, and I'm going to invite you all to say this part with me right now. God speed the day where human blood shall cease to flow. In every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood. For each do evil good, not blow for blow. That day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. To all of our readers, on behalf of the Natick Historical Society and Natick for Black Lives Matter, thank you for your participation tonight. It's moving to me every year when I hear this speech read, and all the more moving to hear our community's voices behind it. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone for being here. Um, enjoy the fourth. <laughs>